Hello, I'm Annelie Riches, um, founding director of Mikhail Riches. Um, I'm also on the RBA Awards jury and I had the pleasure of visiting the two projects we're going to be seeing today, last year. Welcome to the Building Stories Talk, where we look at the RBA award winning buildings, invite the architects to share their stories behind the projects and to give us some insights into their experiences. These, these talks provide a great opportunity to see the careful thought and the real hard work that goes into these projects. It's really interesting today to see these two schemes together, both of which provide accommodation for students during term time, but for very different age groups. Today's special guests are Holly Galbraith from Neil McLaughlin Architects and Ben Burley from Tim Ronalds Architects. And they'll be telling us the stories behind two educational projects, Masters Field Development in Oxford and Asia House, which is part of Seven Oaks School in Kent. Please send your questions in for the Q&A later and I'll be watching out for them um, as we go through the presentations. So the, to the first project we're going to look at, which is Masters Field Development. This addresses a uh, student housing shortage um, in Balliol College in Oxford. Neil McLaughlin Architects have created a significant addition to this college um, at the edge of the urban centre of Oxford and created 22 new student bedrooms and supporting facilities, including a cricket pavilion. I was really excited to visit this scheme, not just because of the beautifully composed facades and courtyards, but also because of the ingenuity of the plans, which create social spaces at the heart of bedroom clusters within large corridors acting as kind of dining rooms for students. And so as the corridors are effectively eliminated. So um, the development won Holly Galbraith, the South Regional Project Architect of the Year Award, and here she is to tell us about it. Thanks, Annalie. Perfect. Um, so I'm Holly, uh, representing Neil McLaughlin Architects today. I'm starting with one of my favourite images of the scheme. I think this sort of captures the essence of what the project is about. These are buildings sat within a landscape. The project, the Masters Field project, is for Balliol College. The site itself sits to the east of the main um, college accommodation, um, which is sort of closer to the civic centre of Oxford. Um, it's useful to situate, I guess, the site in its immediate context because you start to see how it sits and straddles the fringes, as Annalise said, of the civic core um, to the west and then to the east, the larger university parks and developments of significance is the um, Leslie Martin Law Library in the north northeast corner. Um, as an office, I guess we're fortunate to have worked in Oxford for a number of years and the master's field development down here um, in the bottom right joins a series of completed and sort of forecast projects in Oxford. Um, we've currently got underway two projects in North Oxford, um, item 10, Winchester Road in planning and Univ North in the North, which is a similar student accommodation project currently in tender. Here you can see at the wider scale um, how the Masters Field site sort of is situated within wider Oxford. You can see the sort of the arc of the um, east, which is the University Park site. Um, there's some listed deer parks and gardens. Um, you've got Arnie Jacobson's uh, St. Catherine's here, just to the east of that. And then you see sort of nestled to the south, the, the tighter sort of historic grain of Longwall and Hollywell. Um, and all of these characteristics informed the massing and the overall layout of the site. You then shift to the north into larger sort of university um, accommodation buildings. This building is currently under development. This was formerly another Leslie Martin um, scheme that was demolished around the same time that we were constructing um, the Masters Field site. The site itself is bound by several um, sort of buildings of historic significance. Those in the sort of the lime green, a grade one listed of note is St. Cross uh, Church here, which houses the college archives. We also have graduate facilities in Hollywell Manor, which is grade two listed. And then the Leslie Martin Law Library constructed in the sort of late 50s, early 60s, which is two star listed. And then you have the historic um, centre taking you back towards um, Oxford City Centre to the to the left. Part of the brief was also about preserving um, the amenity space, the sports pitches, predominantly cricket, but also uh, tennis and football pitches, which sit to the west of the site. You can see there was a series of existing buildings that occupied the site um, prior to sort of selective demolitions to accommodate the scheme. 
These are some of the buildings of note that sit around the perimeter of the site. And one of the things that struck us when we were first appointed to the project in about 2015 was the disparate set of conditions that bounded the site. Um, predominantly buff um, brick and stonework in the vicinity, but a range of typologies and scales of buildings. To the right, we have the MJP scheme constructed in the late 90s, early noughties. The law library that I mentioned earlier with its sort of cascading and slipping planes um, by Sir Leslie Martin, and then the, um, the Grade 1 listed church, which occupies the corner of the St. Cross Road, Manor Road Junction. What was interesting when we uh, first approached the um, site and researched it was that the site itself represents a series of unrealized unreal master plans. To the south, MJP um, had envisaged a sort of a larger development of student accommodation blocks that would create this sort of daisy chain of buildings around the arc of the cricket pitch. Only those in the blue and yellow were realised. To the north, similarly, Leslie Martin, um, who constructed the building in green, which is one of the 60s um, student accommodation blocks that was demolished to make way for the new site, um, had visions for a much larger master plan that started to communicate with the law library on the other side. And I guess a lot of the development to the north of the site that we go on to realise um, took its cues from the cascading and the slipping of the, the buildings with the planes of the law library up in this northern end. We retained fellows accommodation in the centre of the plan um, as part of the development. The project itself provides 225 student study bedrooms and a one be uh, three bedroom professorial flat which sits at this um, southeastern corner of the site. It also provides a sports pavilion, uh, which Anne Lee mentioned in the centre of the plan, and imagines a future phase of development for an assembly space which um, anchors this corner junction um, and speaks to the, sort of the graduate facilities along Manor Road. The buildings are arranged, there's eight buildings, and they're arranged sort of radially around the arc of the site. Um, at the perimeter of the site, the buildings address the street and have been arranged to sort of respond to the different public realm conditions. Um, whereas at the sort of inner arc, the private world of the, the scholar, um, the, bay, the buildings all have uniform gables, um, the deliberately uniform and unified in arrangement here, um, partially to try and um, bring together an architecture that would try and unify the disparate sets of elements around um, the perimeter of the site. At its core, this project is um, about buildings that form the edges of streets. This is along the south, looking along Jowett Walk. It's also a project that um, seeks to respond to the sort of the materiality and the scale of the immediate historic context. At the south, we skilled buildings appropriately to the sort of the arc of the cottages along Longwall, and we set the buildings back from the street to introduce domestic gardens and frontages, which mimic the residential um, intentions of the buildings in the centre of the site and also further down Longwall. When we move to the north of the site and um, where buildings approximate to the arc of the road, we elevate the student rooms um, up on brick podiums. This obviously provides a visual and an acoustic buffer to the occupants within these rooms and we enhance the glazing and the um, facade buildups here accordingly. But it also um, sort of speaks of the large institutional scale of buildings, particularly the law library and the university developments further north um, that start to occur as you move further north along the road. Here you can see we've also cascaded gables moving southwards to set up a dialogue with St. Cross Church and frame um, the, uh, the gable of the, the archive centre there at the corner of the road. One thing I think that was also important to recognise on this scheme, because it sort of sits at the edge of the civic core and starts to move into sort of residential territories and the parklands, was we wanted to sort of invert this sort of notion and this historic notion, I guess, of colleges that are typically very introverted. They're often sort of set, um, particularly in the centre of um, Oxford and Cambridge as well, behind sort of high walled um, enclosures, offering little sort of glimpses from the public realm into these sort of private inner worlds. Here we wanted to create sort of modest footprint buildings, introducing gaps between each of the buildings um, that would offer sort of views back into the depth of the site, um, this sort of area that's often private. We sort of took our cues from the promontories and the rhythm of buildings that MJP had set up between the courtyards and the buildings uh, to the west of the site. And the views, I guess the gaps between uh, buildings frame views, long views into the sort of the gardens and the cricket pitch beyond. So you've got this link between the public realm and these sort of verdant private views um, beyond, often reserved for this sort of inner world of the, of the scholar. 
And at each of the gaps between the buildings, I don't know if you can see my cursor um, on the screen, we planted a tree. This sort of mimics that what you'd imagine the cricket green at the edge of the um, cricket boundary, but also provides sort of views from the public realm um, towards the, um, the arboriculture deeper into the site. Collectively, um, these buildings also frame a series of new gardens and planted courtyards within the inner world of the site as well. Um, both landscapes that can be used by the occupants and the students of the site and also villas to um, the sports pavilion. The spatial arrangement itself um, was underpinned by early discussions we had with the college. The brief asked us primarily to consider an architecture um, that could reduce and relieve social isolation often felt by the students. To do this, we considered sort of student gathering at the heart of student life, um, clustering students, I guess, around a gathering space in this in, um, instance, a dining table, then clustering study bedrooms around those to create groupings or clusters, as we call them, of study rooms, and then arranged ensembles of buildings around external gathering spaces. In this case, um, this is a sudden, uh, southern quadrangle around one of the veteran, uh, veteran trees on the site. Again, we kept the building footprint small, which allowed us to maximise dual aspect bedrooms um, and offer a range of aspects and outlooks from each of the study rooms. At the centre of each of these clusters, we widened corridors and we elevated the ceilings, as Anna Lee mentioned, maximising um, the use of breakout and additional social space for the students. It was great because this building was delivered in a series of sort of sequential phases and they were occupied at the beginning of lockdown, particularly in this southern quadrangle. And you could see that the students in their clusters or bubbles, I guess, as it was sort of made real use of these, these cluster spaces. We bring natural light and ventilation into these um, widenings of the corridors. Um, through glazed links at the end of each of the, um, the corridor wings. And we painted them in a sort of a mature palette that was agreed um, upon with the, with the college and elevated the ceilings again um, to denote this sort of um, gathering, gathering space. We then sort of scale this up around the site and create this necklace of clusters um, that are um, formed in groupings between six and, and sort of 10 um, study rooms. Here you can see that sort of manifesting itself in the southern quadrangle. Um, you can see the glazed links at the end of the corridors that link and connect these clusters um, between buildings and within each of the floor plans themselves. We also located stair cores on access with kitchens and shared spaces and provide glazed links across and through those two. Um, that was also as part of this opportunity that the college were really interested in, in being able to sort of not um, take a student from the entrance to the site up to their room without having any sort of impromptu um, interaction with some of their peers. We also provided a series of larger social spaces um, as part of the client's brief. This is a junior common room. Um, they're often located adjacent to building entrances and are glazed on multiple aspects, again, to prompt this opportunity for sort of passive interaction between passers-by and the occupants of the rooms. This is a glimpse of the professorial flat, which sits at the third floor of one of the buildings to the south and has views out across um, the south and the west to the deer park um, and back along Jowett Walk. We have a range of about 12 different bedrooms, study bedrooms um, across the site. These were to cater for a range of student vocations, predominantly graduates, but some undergraduate facilities as well, um, and a range of price points as part of the college's banding criteria. But generally all of the rooms have a similar arrangement of furniture, um, comprising a desk, an ensuite bathroom, um, a wardrobe area, and then a bed that's fringed with a window bench and seat. And each of the rooms sort of follow the principles of this. Um, and the clients were really keen that each of the bedrooms are naturally ventilated through opening windows, the twin windows open, and then a smaller uh, sort of section at the foot, the foot of the bed. Here's a photo during one of the, sort of the final inspections with my colleague, Joanna, of the joinery. Um, so excuse the quality of the, sort of the snap here. Um, we were just trying to replicate one of the early sketches of Neil's um, showing how a student or a graduate might occupy one of these window benches take advantage of the sort of amazing views they have across the, across the cricket pitch. 
Externally, each individual study bedroom um, is represented sort of by a, a brick uh, lined bay. We have a primary ordering of piers and lintels that are brick face precast, and then a um, fenestration is held between um, a recessed woven motif that acts as a divider. Internally, um, this divider separates the sort of areas of study to the left hand side and sleep to the right of the bed. And this came about, I guess, because Neil's interested in sort of Semper's readings of the early origins of architecture, particularly early ideas of enclosure and using sort of craft and weaving to create these lightweight screens and divides that would separate different aspects of the, the home or the room. And here, I guess, we took um, sort of literally the idea of tapestry as the divide to separate these two areas internally and express this externally as a woven motif. The woven panels themselves um, help to support the gravity loads of the facade and the piers and lintels, um, but because they're sort of recessed back from the primary ordering of the trabeated frame um, and they're embellished in this sort of decorative woven motif, um, the functionality of this becomes deliberately ambiguous. And that was sort of intentional so that we created this sort of hierarchy um, on the facade of the piers and lintels, the woven motif, and then a tertiary ordering of the fenestration set, set back. The receding of the window and the fenestration also offers privacy to the occupants of the room. More locally, the woven motif takes its cues from the frieze of the Ashmolean um, by Cockrell as well, which the college were really interested in um, the layering of the Oxford history and how that can tie in with the, with the site as a whole. We worked a lot and extensively with a range of specialists and collaborators on this project, Thought Precast being one of them. This is a photo from their yard uh, showing some of the precast peers um, in manufacture. Um, we created a series of profiles that could be scaled up and down through sliding moulds um, and introduce sort of repetitious elements where we could we work extensively often in the office and definitely on this project with the use of mock-ups um, where possible, both um, extensive use of those in the factory and then also on site. I'm sure it drives subcontractors and suppliers and uh, main contractors absolutely mad. Um, but it also enables, I guess, the clients to get a real sense of the scale of this project um, and see some of these early ideas and, and concepts come, come together. We expedited um, the installation of one of these precast bays on site uh, so the clients could and sort of did a fit out of one of the individual rooms internally um, early on in the construction. So the clients can get a real sense of scale of a room and the proportions of this facade. The piers themselves are deep, they're three full bricks deep, and this was intentional, um, both to create sort of uh, passive solar shading on the facade, but also offer sort of privacy to this inner world um, of the occupant within the room. Um, we then repeat these individual modules um, to read as a whole um, by using these sort of repetitious series of splayed piers on the corner um, and dividing piers between each study bedroom. And here you can see the sort of the woven motif framing um, and separating the desk and offering privacy to the bed beyond. The corner piers, um, when read at 45 degree angles, taper to a point. This allows us to maximise sight lines out from the study um, bedroom and also sort of play with this notion of concealing, I guess, the depth of the overall build up and wall as far as possible. Without obscuring sort of or um, impeding on the views from the room, rooms within. We enjoy that when you then read these piers on the oblique and because the fenestration is set back into the depth of the facade that the envelope takes on a more solid appearance um, when, read on, when read on an angle in the 45. Here's just some photos of that. What you don't maybe uh, notice when you pop to site um, in its finished form is that the substructure itself is CLT, cross-laminated timber. Um, Balliol represented the, sort of the first mass timber project for our office. We we dabbled in glue lamb on sort of smaller projects historically, but not on the scale of this, this project. Um, it had many challenges um, as part of the development, not least because we were sort of in a negotiated tender and finishing stage for sadly at the um, event of the Grenfell disaster. And we're trying to learn and come to terms with how to, to work with timber and a combustible material. Um, it was really well received on site. And personally, I really enjoy working with CLT because it makes for a much um, more environmentally friendly like working space like on site compared to sort of the damp and dreary sort of atmospheres you get on site with concrete um, buildings. 
<clears throat> we made some modifications to the um, the overall design of the CLT here by lifting up onto sort of concrete upstands, um, elevating it outside of the ground level. This alleviated some of the college nervousness of using CLT, which hadn't been used on such mass um, across Oxford colleges. I know Alison Brooks's scheme was using it in part and Mansfield by Mika um, had delivered a building um, that was on site just at the start of this project as well. Where possible, we tried to express the CLT in the glue lamp frame. This is the in construction photo of the common room that we saw earlier. Um, and it was great because it meant that the, um, the building came to life and the sequence of spaces um, and buildings around these quadrangles could be imagined very early on um, with the college and some of the, um, the user groups. And I'm going to wrap up now with another timber building that's on the site, which sits at the centre. That's the sports pavilion. This is a sweet chestnut frame that is um, coated in a weathering treatment on the external um, timber and left um, with a clear oil internally. The Cricket Pavilion is a simple single storey structure that is held between two of the student accommodation blocks in the centre of the site. Um, it out, its outlook is western facing across the cricket pitch and offers a sort of a space for cricket spectation and, and uh, changing facilities for the users. It's simple in terms of its massing. Um, there are four sort of timber clad cassettes at the rear of the building. Um, and then there is an overseeling timber lattice canopy um, that extends out to form a covered external canopy beyond the main hall, which sits at the west of the site here. We create great glaze links again through the pavilion um, through to the cricket pitch, which link to clairvoyers in the rear of the fellows gardens to the rear of the site here. Um, it's predominantly glazed and its main hall to offer sort of panoramic views out across the, the cricket pitch and comprises an intricate stacked timber lattice internally um, that includes sort of integrated lighting for a range of scene settings internally. This had some real challenges when we were constructing this because of the amount of timber that we've got in this um, roof structure, we were anticipating quite a lot of settlement and movement of the timber. Uh, Simon of Smith and Warwick Engineers was a teaching fellow at Cambridge at the time and had some students do some stress testing um, with a mock-up. Here, some of our team um, are looking at that with the contractor and the electrical engineers as well. It was a really useful tool as well to work out how we could integrate the lighting. And I'll end here on a slide of the sort of the main hall in completion where you can see these sort of stacked timber lattice soffits over the main, the main space looking back towards some of the student accommodation. I think I might have been a minute too long there, Annalie. I do apologize. Thanks, Holly. Um, that was great. Well, we've got quite a few questions coming in, but first of all, I've got a question. I mean, when I first saw this project and studied it on plan, I was really interested in the the social spaces and also the different size clusters between six and 10 bedrooms. And I wondered whether you, there were any plans to do any post occupancy analysis of, of that. And I'm particularly interested in kind of the ideal size of group to share those spaces. Have you had feedback from any of the students? Yeah, it's interesting. We were sort of receiving real time feedback because they were partially occupied while we were still constructing the northern part of the site. And I think the the college are very accepting that they're, they're used in very different ways. Undergraduates see these central spaces. Um, they like to sort of move around as the college, they in sort of smaller packs. They say between six and eight is their optimal cluster size for undergraduates. They make real use of those central spaces from um, laundry to sort of additional bar space and social spaces. Um, whereas the graduate facilities, they much prefer much larger clusters because they have different timetabling and scheduling. So you can have clusters of sort of 10 to 12 rooms, but find that actually there's always then going to be a frequency of sort of two to six sort of occupants around using the facilities, but never sort of all at once in a concentration. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think six to eight probably is what we would tend to, to work with if we were um, looking at these on other sort of student student configurations but the, the feedback has has been positive I think we we were we were nervous and the college were very nervous initially about acoustics of some of these spaces um, and we enhanced linings and configured bathrooms as a buffer space between the clusters and the rooms to try and offset that but they seem to be well used and it's um yeah it's nice to see them well maintained populated with flowers and yeah. accessories um, when you're there well we've got some good questions um coming in I Let's start with one from John. 
Uh, thanks for the lovely presentation. As a student, I wanted to ask, how have the students and local community engaged with the building? And is the community able to drop by and use the spaces or grounds? So you can definitely book the pavilion hall um, and different sports groups can also use the master's field sports facilities via the college. In terms of conversations with the occupants and students at the time, we had extensive user group discussions, both with the graduate and the undergraduate cohort. I think over the, the sort of the duration of the project, I think I met sort of five, at least five um, junior sort of common room uh, presidents. They were really vocal and really helped in shaping the sort of the arrangement of furniture um, in the student rooms and kitchen provisions and um, materials and so on. It, it was actually really useful to have both the sort of the fellows and the um, college stakeholders and the student groups as well um, participate in the development of the, the clusters and the design of those spaces. Um, Alana's got a question, how does the building connect with all the other buildings on the campus? Is there a direct and easy route between them? So um, it's about a sort of seven to 10 minute walk between the master's field site and the Balliol uh, main site. So I guess the walking between the different um, parts of the um, college campus is advised. There's links as well uh, from the graduate facilities at the north to Hollywell, which has sort of larger common room facilities, um, which is just across the Manor Road um, junction. I don't know, they, they may have additional teaching facilities further afield in Oxford, but I'm not sure. Um, generally, I guess it's walking, um, walking distance. And finally, for now, um, one from Jane. Did your own experience as a student influence the design of the building? Oh, I did not have my own ensuite study bedroom or any beautiful outlook like this, I'm afraid. I was up in Newcastle next to a flyover. So I'd say probably, probably not. Um, <laughs> but it was it was really fascinating to understand just how the sort of the Oxbridge colleges um, take a real interest in pastoral care of the students, the facilities that they're trying to provide, um, the sort of the support network, the um, housekeeping facilities, groundsmen, uh, pastoral check-ins. It's really interesting to see the sort of the setup and understand the sort of the inner workings of these college developments to make a success of the schemes. Um, but yeah, no, uh, nothing like my student room, which no. I reminded them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Not mine either. Um, well, thanks, Holly. Um, Holly, coming back later, we'll for the group discussion, we'll hopefully get through some more of the questions. Um, but our next project is Asia School, at, um, sorry, Asia House at Seven Oaks School. It's a 60 bed boarding house sitting on a lawn between a Victorian villa and echoing its appearance. It won the um, Southeast RIBA Regional Award in 2022 with the judges saying it was a skillful response to a complex brief. And I really enjoyed visiting this project um, because it's got a very simple domestic form, but actually the plan is incredibly complex and it houses a series of social spaces at different scales and provides a sense of home for quite young children, as well as three houses for um, teachers and their families, which are really cleverly nestled into the plan and provide privacy, but also let them control the children a bit, I imagine. So I'd like to welcome Ben Burley to talk about it. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I'd like to talk about um, Asia House, which is um, a boarding house we completed um, in 2019 for Seven Oaks School. So the boarding house is for 60 boys aged um, 13 or upwards, and, and we won the commission in a competition in 2016. Um, here it is sitting on the um, lawn and it's in front of Park Range, a listed Victorian villa at the southern end of um, Seven Oaks High Street. And this is the client and the school site. Um, Seven Oaks School is a co-educational independent school. It has over a thousand pupils, some of them boarders and some of them day pupils. And the age range is between 11 and 18. Um, in 2005, Seven Oaks School commissioned and adopted a master plan completed by um, Tim Rollins Architects to guide the future development of the school. And in this area, you can see the high street that runs through Seven Oaks and the school buildings which um, sit on one side. And in the distance, the school abounds um, Knoll Park, which is in Elizabethan um, Manor House and um, Deer Park, which is now owned by the National Trust. So the school 
<clears throat> was founded in the 15th century, but it was in the late 19th century the school began to expand along the high street. This map from 1896 shows the school buildings lining the street, looking east to Knoll Park. And the high street and the configurations of the spaces within the school are sort of recognisable still today. The photo shows Old School, which is the school's oldest surviving building, together um, with the flanking almshouses. And you can see the gardens which stretch from behind the high street down onto the deer park beyond. And it's in this space that the school has then developed. So this is the aerial map really of the school grounds today, highlighted in blue. Um, but in 1948, um, the school was gifted Park Grange, a farmhouse and area of land um, to the south, highlighted in red. And this was the site for the project we're looking at today. As I mentioned, we've been working with the school since 2005 on their master plan. And in 2018, we revisited it and um, looked at their targets for the future, which included increasing the number of students. But their main um, driver was to increase the proportion of borders from 30 to 40 percent. And this is where the project um, fits in. And um, some of the projects we've been working with the school are new projects, and some of them are um, adjustments or renovations to existing buildings. The area for the boarding house is seen up here on the top corner of the site plan. Um, and below you can see that how the new buildings and throughout the school have grown along the back of the um, high street in the gardens. So this was one of the projects we've um, initially completed with the school, which we won in competition in 2009, which is a performing arts centre or the space. And it comprised of a concert hall and associated music practice rooms and a recital hall. Then another project we realised with the school in 2018 was the sixth form centre and um, science and technology centre, which again, we won in a competition. Here, the labs are um, located around a century lit atrium. And then in 2016, we were invited to the competition for the Park Range site, which was a boarding house. Here you can see Park Range, the original farmhouse, its lawn, which was the proposed location for the um, boarding house, and then the main school site to the north. Over the centuries, one house or another has stood on Park Grange site and the present house was built in um, 1860 and it's been used as a boarding house since it was gifted to the school in 1948. There are two other boarding houses um, in the vicinity, one which was built in 1965, which is um, currently being replaced, and a second house which was built in 1997. So part of the master plan was really to strengthen this part of the school site as um, sort of a residential and boarding part of the campus. So this is a school <clears throat> site part and park range in the boarding house, which is a girls boarding house and the lawn that it sits. Um, and back in 2006, initial work was done on the design of the first boarding house. Um, we've worked with the local authority and the planners on the master plan and a full scale mock up of the most visible part of the building was constructed on site and it was made of scaffolding and polythene to demonstrate to the planners that the visibility um, of the building from sensitive you know, positions and, and from Tunbridge Road. So in 2016, there was a competition and we had three sort of concept, three preoccupations which really underline the design. One was the need to devise an architecture that would relate to the context of the elegant villa. The new needed to preserve the lawn and sit comfortably on the site, retaining as many trees as possible and minimising the impact on the views to the south and east. The second concept was to find a way of arranging rooms around furnished communal spaces rather than along thin corridors. Um, this observation arose from our research into existing boarding houses at the school, which showed that houses that were conversions of old houses were far more popular than those more recent purpose designed ones. And really the third concept was to maintain a domestic scale. 
Um, the boys living in this house are quite young and we wanted to create an architecture that was homely. We wanted buildings which were two-storey as in most houses and with social and you know public spaces on the ground floor and their bedrooms on the first floor. And this was the third concept really of the competition scheme. So this was a client, these were the, the, the students that we briefed and we spent a lot of time with the school consulting students and staff and visiting other Preston projects, developing it. And again, gen generally the older converted houses were well loved as they had a variety of spaces. And what became apparent was the most important part of any of the boarding houses at the school was the, the house kitchen, which uh, kept the boys well stoked. The school brief required a variety of bedroom designs for the various age groups and flexibility and for future lettings, which the school uses the building for in summer schools, etc. And um, single ensuite rooms were devised for the sixth form students, twin rooms for the year 10 and 11 students, and three and four bedrooms for the year nine and 10 students. And the distribution of the different room sizes in the pavilions um, allowed for fluctuating numbers of the students and was able to build up each year and build in future flexibility. And a key part of this school um, project for the school was the incorporation of ensuite um, bathrooms to many of the um, bedrooms. And these were designed to be um, maintained and accessed from, from the corridor spaces without uh, being um, interrupting the occupants of the room. So a lot of design research went into the best way of creating ensuite rooms um, and the layouts of the spaces. So this aerial view really shows the massing of the, of, of the building and the requirements of the 60 bed boarding house really determine the size and the placement on the site. It was split into three pavilions, forming an L shape, enclosing the southwest corner of the lawn. It was designed to retain as much open space as possible. The entrance to the boarding house, like that of the Park Range Villa, faces east in towards the school and connects onto the routes and paths that go under Tunbridge Road through, uh, through an underpass and connects onto the main campus. And at the heart of the school is the um, large sitting room and uh, kitchen area. And these spaces open out onto the lawn to the north and private gardens to the south. And incorporated in the design of the scheme, we had two um, houses for the boarding house master and a two bedroom flat for the tutor, which had to be incorporated. And these were um, planned towards the west of the building at the back where they had more privacy So we produced a series of models to test the scale and the massing of the house and the aim was to design a boarding house with the same scale and character of park range. So each of the pavilions were about 18 metres square, which is the same sort of footprint as the Victorian house. And the new boarding house was to follow the principles and manners of the old. We wanted a domestic rather than institutional character and um, we incorporated elements of comparable scale. We introduced pergolas that connected the new house to the lawn. Um, and windows which are celebrated on the elevations with picture frame surrounds. The result was a house set on the edge of the lawn surrounded by trees facing into the school and setting up a relationship across the lawn with the existing house. So internally this drawing just really shows the organisation of the accommodation in the three pavilions. Here um, furthest east is the most public pavilion and this has the main entrance um, it incorporates the staff offices and the public rooms which are used by not only the students but some of the um, other members of the of the school the second pavilion incorporates a student entrance which um, passes the boarding house master's office so there's a little bit of surveillance here but this is their back door as such and um, leads them into their boot room locker room and, and the laundry um, and you can see in green towards the west side of the building are the two houses and the staff accommodation. The first floor shows the bedrooms in brown, which are um, accommodated in clusters around communal social spaces. We wanted to avoid having long single or double loaded corridors. 
but also importantly, that the staff accommodation could access the first floor um, spaces. So at night time, they can help the students where needed. The first floor plan really, no, ground floor plan, sorry, here just shows the, that organization in a little bit more detail. At the heart of their house is the sitting room and the yellow denotes where the staff accommodation is on the western side. We wanted the house to have a domestic quality and look and feel like a home, and this applied inside as well as out. So as part of that, communal rooms were conceived using rich, warm hues in their decoration and bedrooms and study rooms were calmer, more neutral hues. This plan really just shows how the richer and more characterful colors are used pull out these key spaces. And in section, it shows how the clusters of the study rooms are based around communal top lit spaces and each of the pavilions had their own staircase. I'd briefly like to just take you on a tour of the building around some of the key spaces. So in the more public entrance pavilion, and we've created a quieter sitting room. And this is used for meeting parents or for staff to meet students but is out of hours, it's also used for reading and playing board games and music. This is the main sitting room, which opens onto the lawn on one side, quite publicly, and on the other side, opens onto their private garden. The space needed to be large enough for film nights and house suppers, where the boys um, invite other members of the school um, and host them in their house. This photo shows the um, sitting room from the other end, looking towards the entrance and the kitchen on the right hand side and the lawn on the left. So at the heart of the house is the house kitchen. And this is connected to the sitting room and the student garden and the boys have their own courtyard and barbecue area, which is really well used in the summer. At the end of school, when you've been back back to uh, in I see how this um, space is and the amount of toast that four boys get through is it's quite phenomenal really. We also had a games room in the public sort of pavilion and this was provided at the front of the house and we wanted to separate the games room away from the main sitting area to you know sort of avoid a common room feel. There was also a communal study space which is used for meetings and presentations but also it's being used as a facility for staff for meetings and training now and then if we go upstairs i'd just like to show you some of the spaces that we um created in each of the pavilions and at the heart of each pavilion is a top lit social space and these were picked out using different characters of color This is an example of one of the top lit social spaces. And here with the rooms for the students can access. They provide breakout spaces from the bedrooms, but we also try to create views out through the stairwells to the um, lawn and trees beyond. In each of the communal spaces, there's a tea point, which they can make their own cups of tea. And this is a photo of one of the three bed shared study rooms. And these larger communal rooms were shared, um, positioned on the corners of the pavilions, providing dual aspect spaces. And finally, one of the examples of the sixth form um, ensuite study rooms. And I'd like to quickly talk about the external appearance and the materials for the new boarding house take their cue from the existing materials of the Victorian villa and the dark grey slate of the roof and textured ragstone walls um, here are articulated by white casement timber windows and a pergola and it provides a you know quite jolly handsome palette that um, has appealing domestic qualities which we wanted to emulate and incorporate in the new project. So our proposed palette of external materials was a buff um, brick to match the tones of the stone walls and we used a dark zinc roof and probably the key element of the project was a, a buff plain cone hung tiled um, facade which had the texture of the stone of the existing house. 
This was one of the views um, we used for planning, which shows the boarding house front entrance and how the pavilion design of the new building helps break up the massing and creates sort of a domestic scale, um, which chimes with park range. This other view shows how the pergolas um, wrap the building and um, connect it to the lawn. The pergolas help actually provide a bit of depth to the building and a buffer zone and add a bit of privacy between the ground floor rooms and the paths which pass the building. So the elevations on this project are composed from these three sort of key elements, windows which are celebrated, so rather than just holes in walls, we added um, an additional picture frame surrounds which really express the windows, the pergola, and then the expressive hung tile facade. And a, a little note really on the construction details, the building is highly sustainable um, and we approached it through a fabric first. It has high levels of insulation and we used CLT as the main you know, structure. And the boarding house was designed to bring excellent to near passive house standards. And um, the CLT structure, um, and we worked with Urban on this, is supported on a thin concrete raft, which minimizes the embodied carbon. Um, the house is all electric and has mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems. And the main loading really was for the water. And um, working with Max Fordham's, we, um, they devised a two-stage system of air source heat pumps and water-to-water -water heat pumps. A key construction detail was really the windows, and these were carefully detailed to be installed before the external facing leaf. And this allowed the envelope to be constructed independently of the interiors. And this really assisted with the tight construction program of the project. A key element of the facade were the clay hung tiles and we worked with Kmar on the boat design. It was an iterative process. We did some of it in CAD and 3D, but a lot of it was done with full scale mock-ups. And here are some of the photos that we um, were sent from Kmart from their factories as they produce the different tiles and particularly the more tricky elements, which are the corner tiles in this instance. Um, colour samples of the tiles um, took a long time to achieve the, the textures and the and graduations that we wanted. And um, we worked with them with different glazes and different finishes to obtain what we wanted. And that was really to find a tile that chimed and worked well with the, the tones of the stonework on the Victorian villa. A key part of the success of the construction was the one-to-one -one mock up that we often do with projects. And this was really useful for both ourselves and the client and also the contractor to look at a full scale section of the wall builder. It helped them to look at the sequence of construction, but also to look at detail and the, the, the more tricky elements so that when it came to and the sequence of um, finishing the external envelope, um, all the uh, teething problems were ironed out. And finally, here are some of the uh, close-ups of the tiles in the sunlight, and we were very happy with how the facade sort of subtly changes across the day, depending on which, uh, which side you're looking at it. Here are the, um, here's the completed elevations with the, the components we've been looking at, which were the windows, the tiles, and the pergolas, which um, create the language. And finally, the new boarding house sitting across the lawn from the existing house um, at the entrance, and just how comfortable I think the two buildings sit together. Um, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been very satisfying to see how the building is now embedded in in this part of this part of the school site. Thanks, Ben. Um, we have got some questions for you come in. But um, firstly, I, I remember when I visited, I was very impressed with the environmental performance of the building and that aspect of it. Um, was that was that something that came from the client? Was it part of the brief or did you manage to um, bring them <laughs> down a journey with you? No, it, 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 it came from discussions with the client and this this type of project, this is the first um, sort of contemporary boarding house that they have. A lot of their houses are in Victorian, you know, Victorian houses within the town. 
um, which you know have a lot of character but also cost a lot to run. And um, the brief for this particular project was that you know the requirements now for boarding houses a lot a lot of the rooms are en suite bathrooms. So they wanted a, a building that was um, you know environmentally sustainable but also you know had low running costs. Um, and part of um, the design of building on this sensitive part of the school site was that there wasn't any existing um, services. So hence the um, uh, approach for you know, uh, working with Max Fordham's was looking at sustainable approach of just using electric underfloor heating um, and an air source heat pump enclosure for the water loads, which in a boarding house with lots of 14 year old boys having showers is actually quite, you know, quite high demand. So it was a combination of working with, you know, uh, a client that wanted a sustainable building, but also, you know, working with ourselves and Max Fordham's to produce a, you know, a, 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 you know environmentally friendly solution. Great. Um, I'm going to start off with a question from Stephanie. Lovely drawings. Um, have you had any feedback from the students and any lessons learned for future projects? And I know there is another phase coming, isn't there? But the girls. <laughs> yes, thank you. No, I mean, it, it, what, what, has, what was very nice with working with this client, which we've built up a relationship for a long, you know, many years was the trust that they allowed us to work with them on a boarding house. We hadn't, you know, designed or built a boarding house before. So it was nice to work with them um, from scratch on designing that. And um, we can't have done too badly as we're currently finishing off a second boarding house, but there was lots of lessons learned in, in, in this house in terms of how, um, um, you know, they would, like, they would like the spaces. I think the spaces that have worked really well are the communal spaces and particularly for the sixth form students that, you know, being able to work in your room privately is great, but also sometimes it's nice to, I mean, a bit like Holly was explaining with graduates, is they do like the company as well. So that that was one success. Um, we've looked at bathrooms quite a lot in the second design and, you know, moved away from a wet room design. I don't know whether it was just 14 year old boys or, um, um, you know, the design that actually, you know, more enclosed contained shower spaces have been requested this time. So yes, lots of lessons learned and, and, and every you know, iteration of a, a project or a building you do, you learn and you learn so much by testing new, new items out. I've got a question from Jonathan. Did you ever feel restricted by the presence of the listed villa? Did the, did the design go through many iterations to satisfy planning? Um, did it go through? No, I think with um, the master plan, we, we work with schools um, in, in formulating a master plan quite early on and and by presenting them to planners and as a as a sort of roadmap to the school we find that very useful so very very early on even before the school ran the competition for the the, the boarding house the the planners understood you know the thinking behind a a um a boarding house in this part of school part of the school and you know we demonstrated with the mock-ups that it wasn't going to you know, be detrimental to the views or, or the character of the space. Um, I think that the thing that we wanted to do most in, in this space was the placemaking between the two villas. And actually the thing that was most precious to this part of the school was maintaining that lawn between the two spaces. It's, it's a much loved lawn and is used lots in the school. So, you know, the architecture is one thing, but actually it was maintaining the sort of the character of the open lawn and that part of the site was was you know really key and helped very much, I think, with the you know the um the planning application and discussions we had with them. I've got a question from Sarah. What was the process of sourcing bespoke tiles to echo the Victorian villas facades? I mean they're they're very unusual T-shaped um tiles, aren't they? But I, yes. I they were seen somewhere else and they've been recreated. Yes, so, so, so um, the, the, we, we, you know, obviously Sussex and Kent has a hi history of hung tile facades and, but actually the, the, the tile shape um, Tim had, uh, had seen in France in Dunkirk and, and we spent quite a long time with prototypes in the office and car trying to understand how this long shape was, was, you know, was, was formed, but actually, you know, it turned out that with the overlaps, you needed this T shape. So it was quite fun sort of prototyping different shapes of tile and, and, and texture. 
but we wanted something that you know was modern but was still you know in terms of a of a texture you know chimed with the stonework of the existing house thanks ben i'm going to bring back holly now for some um questions for both of you um okay hang on a sec okay this is um for both of you from felix do you think the students really appreciate these beautiful environments and how lucky they are <laughs> shall i go first yeah um, go I mean, I, I think they definitely do. You kind of get a sense that they're enjoying both the process of developing it, particularly those who participated in the design um, and being able to shape sort of accommodation that they would be in and then their sort of peers and um, sort of subsequent occupants would be. Um, I guess like, I mean, studying anywhere at any university is difficult. And in Oxbridge, there is a sort of a pressure and an intensity to sort of the academic work that the students do. So I think it's important to give them a space for sort of rest and relaxation and also sort of the individual um, sort of concentration of study. Um, they, they seem to, the, the buildings are well maintained. The, they, I've been back several times since it was handed over and they seem to take care of it, both the staff and the sort of housekeeping team. Um, the scouts and so on and and the students so I'd, I'd hope that was sort of testament to them enjoying enjoying the space and Ben you mentioned that previously the students had wanted to live in the old accommodation yes. and I just wonder how it's going do they well I think um, I think what was nice hearing from the hearing from the uh, house mistress and matron is they have to shoo out now students from the other houses because they they like using the spaces in this one so um I think there is some house envy now across this the campus. So no, I think um, I think the, the the lesson really from the the, ex, the existing houses was different types of spaces and different scales of space. I think you know the old houses have those nooks and crannies where students can you know have a bit of privacy or um, you know all come together in a larger larger space. So I think it was just we tried very hard to provide a different different scales of space particularly because they're young young students here so you don't want big overwhelming spaces another question um from joshua thanks for the presentations does your designs allow for adaptations with future needs i.e accessibility and environmental adaptations um so the the scheme um, as delivered delivers a series of sort of accessible rooms both wheelchair accessible and then to cater for a series of needs um, allergens um, modified fit outs um, we provided accessible rooms both at the north and the south of the site and then associated kitchen facilities there's also sort of um, evacu self evacuation lifts in each of the buildings that um, make them fully accessible at all all levels some of the larger spaces we definitely did feasibility studies early on to talk to the college about how they may be adapted to future uses and fit outs um, down the line should they change programs um, or want some versatility particularly with the pavilion halls and the common rooms um, so that it definitely formed part of the brief um, but at the moment we, we sort of provisioned within the development as it was for a series of accessibility um, needs to cater for for that and Ben I think we've got a minute left <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, as part of the design, there was a you know an accessible wheelchair friendly room which we you know um, incorporated, and that's actually now in use in this house, which is um, it's been really you know nice to have feedback from the school about how how that room is you know is in the right place and it integrates you know with the other students. So um, you know it's been good to have that type of feedback, and and and, and you know that's been taken into the other house which is currently being constructed. So. It's about, yeah, that, that connection and involvement that everyone can have. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Sorry for people's um, questions that haven't been asked. Um, but I want to say thank you very much to the, our special guests, Holly Galbraith and Ben Burley. And um, just to remind you that our building stories can be found on our RBA YouTube channel if you want to look at them again. Goodbye. <laughs>